Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Rina Agarwal, Robert Emmett McDonough Professor of Finance here at Georgetown University. And I'm also the director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Welcome to the Georgetown webinar on COVID-19 and the functioning of financial markets. The response to this event has been clearly overwhelming. Everyone is interested in the financial markets. It's very much on their minds. These are truly unprecedented times. First of all, I hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. Each of us has the responsibility to follow the guidelines of healthcare experts so that this disease can come under control quickly. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are at the front lines in helping others. The Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy provides thought leadership for global finance. We believe in excellence in research to impact practice and policy. The center was created after the financial crisis of 2008, when Washington DC became the new global financial hub, unfortunately. It is ironic, now on our 10th anniversary, we are dealing with a global health crisis that's having a major impact on the economy and the financial markets. This is truly global in scope. It's related to health, but it's having a huge impact on the economy and the financial markets. This is not something we've seen before. Today, markets do operate quite differently from even 10 years ago. The capacity of global exchanges, market participants, and investors to operate remotely has been at display in the current environment. Global financial markets trade not only stocks, but also bonds, futures, currencies, and a host of other products that are linked together globally. U.S. markets have continued to operate very efficiently during this crisis. I do want to remind everyone, in order for Main Street to function efficiently, to provide jobs, to innovate, it is critical for our financial markets to function efficiently. We at the Center for Financial Markets and Policy are certainly looking at market structure issues but the center is also deeply engaged in finance and technology issues, in ESG issues. I invite you to learn more about the activities of the center by visiting our website and also following our Twitter handle at GUFinPolicy. Today we have an excellent panel moderated by Mike P.O.R. of the Milken Institute Mike is a former SEC commissioner and a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Center. Mike is also an alum of Georgetown University, our MBA program. He is joined by five former chief economists. We have Jim Overdahl, Larry Harris, Chester Spad, Craig Lewis, and Jeff Harris. Jeff also served as the chief economist of the CFTC. Before I turn this over to Mike, POR to moderate, I do want to point out some logistics. We will keep a few minutes at the end for Q&A. Please send your questions via the Zoom chat feature. And, uh, and uh, if we have some time, we'll see if we can use the raise your hand feature at the end. My colleague, Professor Alberto Rossi, the Associate Director of the Center, will manage the questions. Please do make sure you keep yourself unmuted during the uh, panelist discussion. And uh, we'd also prefer if you could turn your cameras off. I want to thank our team at the McDonough School of Business and especially Anna Cormas, our Assistant Director of the Center, for making this event possible. I want to highlight tomorrow we have another event. We are kicking off our virtual global FinTech finance series 
and uh, we have a number of great speakers. This will be every Friday from 12 to 1. If you're interested, please visit our website and let us know. You can sign up there. Mike, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Rena. Um, and thank you for uh, putting on such an important discussion and lining up such a distinguished group of panelists. I'm really pleased to, uh, to be part of this. So let's get right to it. Uh, as, as Rena mentioned, the coronavirus has created tremendous volatility in global markets. Markets are reacting to new information about the spread of the virus, the health effects of the virus, the private sector and government responses to the virus, and the resulting economic effects. Equity market circuit breakers, first put in place after the 1987 stock market crash, uh, have been tripped by my count, I think, four times over the past few weeks. Uh, the uncertainty in financial markets have, have had some calling for the markets to close, while others have been advocating for the markets to remain open. So I want to get our panelists' thought on this debate. So first, let's talk about the importance of financial markets in general. So on one end of the spectrum, we have people like Warren Buffett, uh, who once said that I buy on the assumption that they could close the market for the next day and not reopen for five years. So clearly, he doesn't think markets need to be open every day. On the other end of the spectrum, we have recently the Department of Homeland Security declared that the entire financial services sector uh, as what they call essential critical infrastructure workforce. And this week, the Treasury Department, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, specifically emphasized the essential role of capital markets activities. So let's find out where our panelists fall on that spectrum. So why, why, let, why do we need financial markets? What, what essential functions and services do they actually provide? And why is it important for the markets to remain open as long as they function properly? And so with that, I'll start, let's start with Craig first, uh, then we'll go to Jim and then, and then to Larry. Great, uh, thank you, Mike. Make sure, I'm, make sure I'm unmuted and everyone can hear me. Um, thank you, Mike. Rena, thank you for putting on this panel and inviting me to participate in it. Um, I think the key functions of a financial market or a well-functioning financial market is the ability to provide liquidity on demand and to, to facilitate price discovery. So if we think about why keeping a market is open, I think investors still need liquidity and closing markets would impede liquidity at a time when investors need it most. Some sense this is, would just be another liquidity shock to folks that need access to liquid capital, even if the value of that capital has declined. Um, so with respect to price discovery, um, I think there are a lot of reasons to, have, to, to think that price discovery is important. Uh, certainly some price suppressing trading will only add to investor anxiety as the market loses track of value. And this anxiety is going to be, will be at, exacerbated when it's uncertain when markets would reopen again. So one of the questions that we should be asking is if, if there is a decision to close markets, how long do you keep them open and what would be the procedures? I think one of the Mike briefly mentioned circuit breakers. One of the key features of a circuit breaker is everybody knows in advance when they're going to happen or the conditions under which they would happen. So there's full transparency around that. So that so it's important to continue to provide liquidity, and this helps in basically facilitate price discovery. Um, one of the the side features of price discovery is that in, sort of regulators can use it as a gauge to understand well, how the markets actually are evaluating the decision-making process, and they would shut down that, that avenue of sort of independent information. And then as a, maybe a side or a final point I want to make is how does this affect markets in the long run? How, what does it do to investor confidence? It seems that shutting down markets has the the, the possibility of impairing investor confidence and possibly resulting in investors being less willing to participate in markets in the future if they believe that they can't get liquidity when they need it. So Mike, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Okay, so Jim, uh, in addition to um, Jeff being chief economist also at the CFTC, so were you. 
Um, give us your perspective as someone who's, uh, who was a chief economist at a market, you know, other than the capital markets, uh, uh, a risk management type market, what, what types of functions do they, do they solve? Well, risk management obviously is another crucial role of markets in addition to price discovery. And I think, you know, echoing what Craig said, if, if we step back and look at markets and what they do, they're aggregating information. And if the flow of that information is volatile, which it has been very much so recently, it's not surprising that markets are reflecting this and are also volatile. But that's just a reflection to me of the market doing its job. And I think that if you closed markets, first of all, that just rumors of closing markets can be dis- destabilizing in its own right if it leads to behavior where people try to rush towards the exits. But closing markets would only ensure that people would be trapped into their market positions with no way to manage the risks that they face that are not going away. They're true un- underlying fundamental risks, but they would be trapped without any way to respond to fundamental information about the positions that they hold. So I think for th- those reasons, uh, you know, risk management is a, and price discovery are key reasons to keep markets open. Okay, so Larry, we have liquidity, price discovery, risk management. Anything else you'd like to add? We should talk about the importance of that information that the markets produce. Markets produce information about securities that's valuable to uh, decision makers throughout our economy. And that information is aggregated from the uh, information that hundreds, thousands of people have about, sometimes millions, uh, about the prospects of firms and of, of contracts and, and uh, bonds and so forth. At a time when there's tremendous uncertainty about the real nature of the economy, uh, it's important that we have that information so that policymakers can see which companies are getting into trouble, so that bondholders can recognize when uh, companies are approaching bankruptcy so that they can be more vigilant uh, and ensure that uh, management uh, represents their interests as well as the interests of the equity holders. Um, And in general, uh, to also ensure that um, that people don't get trapped into situations where um, uh, uh, they're holding this is a different issue. We'll, we'll talk to, touch this issue later. Um, uh, we're going to be referring to situations where uh, prices become uh, different from value and people trade. But if we're talking about closing the markets, people wouldn't be trading. So uh, to summarize, the information is really valuable. And at times when uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, that information is more valuable than ever. To deny decision makers that information would be quite foolish. All right, great. Thanks, Larry. Uh, at this point, I want to bring in uh, Chester uh, and Jeff. But before I do that, um, I just want to remind people who are listening uh, to this that you can submit questions through the, the Zoom chat feature. Uh, for many of you, it's at the bottom of the screen where it says uh, more dot dot dot. You click on that and there's a chat feature in which you could submit questions. And Professor uh, Alberto Rossi is going to be um, collating those and sending them to me in real time. And um, we're happy to respond to as many of those as we can. So Chester, let me turn to you. Um, first, I want to get your thoughts on the Warren Buffett view that, that markets don't need to be open every day. Does he have a point? And second, uh, I want to get your thoughts, um, not only the equity markets, but the credit market. So recent actions by the Federal Reserve, um, they've been intervening in the repo markets, the commercial paper markets, even the corporate bond markets show that they believe that liquidity is very important in these markets. So what, what's your perspective on that? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, happy, to, happy to address that. Um, so perhaps Warren, Buffett's, Warren Buffett um, uh, doesn't need to be in the, in the markets uh, every, every day, but society, you know, as my fellow panelists have highlighted, society needs markets um, because different players, perhaps unlike Warren Buffett, um, have the have the have the ability have the need for liquidity, and I would have thought someone like Warren Buffett would have been in more would have been interested in supplying liquidity um, to meet the to, to meet the needs of other investors in 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 our in our in our in our, in our society. And in circumstances like the present, the liquidity, the reallocation of liquidity is incredibly important, even compared to normal times. Um, w- w- with respect to the Federal Reserve and liquidity provision. I think it's interesting to kind of reflect back 
from what already was happening pre-corona corona, uh, last fall. Um, uh, I think evidence started to emerge um, uh, with, with the actions of the Federal Reserve needing to um, provide relief uh, in, the, in the repo markets because of the dysfunction in the repo markets, really going back to last September, um, that there were unintended consequences with Dodd-Frank um, that, that, led to, that had led to collateral shortages. Um, now those issues were, were the Federal Reserve had, had largely resolved um, um, just as, as, corona, as corona was hitting. Uh, but look, look, but we do face a lot of challenges uh, in our regulatory system with respect to liquidity. Now, more, 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 more recently, liquidity uh, has become a huge issue with concerns about the viability, the viability of various um, uh, products uh, related to, de to, de to potential default concerns. And so, the Federal Reserve has stepped in with new a new facility in the money market fund space and an indication at the start of this week uh, that they're prepared to do whatever it takes with respect to buying uh, corporate asset, assets. And all of these are, are steps uh, to try to ensure that the economy has adequate liquidity. And I think that's very, very important. At the same time, one of the challenges is gonna be ultimately to be, as it is in situations like, like these, to be able to distinguish uh, liquidity issues from solvency issues, and what I mean by that is, it could be that with respect to some business, some but obviously not all business models, those business models may no longer be viable over the long run on a going forward basis, and that would those would point to situations in which we there could be some solvency solvency challenges in the economy. All right, thanks, Chester. All right, Jeff, let's get your views. All right, and just following up on what Chester had to say there, I mean, I think one of the things that we learned from financial markets being open, um, we see that if you look at the cross section of returns that we've seen, Russell 2000 is down substantially more than say the S&P 500 and goes to the fact that the markets are sending signals that say mar small businesses and small companies are actually bearing the major brunt of this. When we see the COVID-19 virus spreading, you know, the first people getting laid off are the most vulnerable in our society and small businesses that are serving pizzas or you know running restaurants are completely shut down um we end up seeing the, the financial markets actually do reflect that information and i think that's like going back to the policy implication that's an important thing um that financial markets convey to the world about what is the aggregate sort of viewpoint on what's happening and where are the problems most severe in the economy so that's i think an important thing if we go back to what uh, um, the risk management function you know being at the cftc one of the things that I had mentioned as a chief economist is that one of the things that's great about financial markets is that usually the information hits there first and it tends to be a leading indicator of what's going on in the economy. And one of the things as a chief economist I tried to make clear is that we shouldn't shoot the messenger. So if the financial markets are giving us signals then we shouldn't be saying it's the financial market's fault. It's really that aggregated information. As long as we think that the markets are functioning properly, then I think then they serve their purpose in providing that early warning and early signal about what problems might be occurring in the economy. The derivative markets in particular were set up and have been thriving basically um, on the risk management premise that risk management in the economy has become ever more important over the last few decades. And people have found that financial securities, you know, futures, options, derivative swaps of all types have been able to manage some of the risk and afford people to actually parse out risk either selling off the risk to other individual investors or having some individual investors take that risk. And then that risk management transfer function, I think is central to the derivative markets that we run in the United States. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, so let me, let me call the question explicitly here. Do, does any one of you, the five of you, think that we should close the markets right now? No, I'm seeing no. Does, does anyone, okay, no, everyone, I, I agree. So we have five former chief economists and another former uh, SEC person who all agree that we should be keeping the markets open as is right now for all the reasons that they talked about. Now, having said that, uh, we know that over time, uh, over in our, in our history, there have been times when markets have had to close. Um, and so my question to you all, what would be the key indicators that the regulators and policymakers would be looking at in terms of uh, what would be triggers for closing the markets, right? Now, you all are, 
um, you know, for, former chief economist, you're economist by training, thinking about the, the costs and benefits of closing the markets. At some point, we reach there. So, Jim, let me start with you. Um, Last week, one of uh, the CME's direct clearing firms, uh, Ronin Capital, was unable to meet its capital requirements. Is, is this a cause for alarm? Well, I think I'll, I'll talk about Ronin here in a second, but I think to your fundamental question about what conditions might we be looking at uh, and what regulators would be looking at, and I would say that they'd be on the lookout for any impairment to the critical underlying uh, market infrastructure, the plumbing, if you will, of you know, processing, clearing, and settling trades. And I think we saw this after 9-11. Uh, we saw um, uh, the, uh, the stock market close or halt trading because of clearing issues. But that, those issues were quickly resolved and trading quickly resumed, resumed once these workarounds to these clearing issues were found. I think with respect to what you just mentioned at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange this last week with a firm failing to, a clearing firm failing to make it meet its uh, uh, requirements or its obligations to the clearinghouse, is that cause for alarm? Well, I think if it had been a systemically important clearing firm, then possibly yes, but it wasn't. And the good news, I think, is that this failure was quickly resolved using pre-established procedures. And, and let me just point out that quick resolution of failures was precisely one of the lessons we took away from 2008 to to resolve failures before they could propagate through the system and I think that that was part of the policy response to the financial crisis that that is we recognize that one of the advantages of a cleared environment was that positions could easily be valued and sold quickly to stronger hands and I think that also means though that we need to be looking very carefully at our clearing houses because we have now, by deliberate policy choice, uh, concentrated a lot of risk there. So that would, I think, address both your questions about what should we look for and your specific question about the CME. Okay, so clearing houses clearly are, are part of a, an essential part of the infrastructure uh, that we need to make sure uh, continues to run smoothly. Uh, other panelists, you wanna raise your hand if you wanna weigh in here on, on what Jim talked about in terms of anything, Larry. Sure. I think there are two reasons why we might close markets. Uh, one is essentially unimaginable and the second is unlikely. So the first unimaginable reason is that we might close the markets to protect the workers uh, in the markets. Um, but that would be, uh, say, workers on floor-based exchanges. But we don't have uh, floor-based exchanges operating now. Uh, the two floor-based exchange, the two main floor-based exchanges, SIBO and the New York Stock Exchange, have completely converted to electronic trading. So, with electronic trading, uh, uh, we don't have a, a need to protect the workers in the market. We might argue that we wouldn't have to protect them anyway because the markets are so incredibly important that they should bear that risk, uh, just as our uh, primary responders do, or first responders do, in other parts of the economy. But we don't have to address that issue because it's simply not there. The second reason is um, more interesting and uh, though I think still very unlikely, uh, something that we should be thinking about. When, um, if volatility becomes extraordinary, even more than we've seen so far, it's possible that uh, entities lose confidence in other entities, a counterparty risks and so forth. Or it's possible that flows become unbalanced. Somebody owes money to somebody else and they're expecting money from uh, a third party, and if they don't get the money from the third party, they can't pay off the uh, what they owe to the first party and so forth. Um, in those situations, if that happens very, very quickly, you can get a crash because basically the system gets all tied up and uh, it, it can't move forward. Nobody trusts uh, their ability to do business with anybody else. In situations like that, you want to stop the markets so that you can uh, slow things down and unravel, un unravel what's happening and perhaps have a, a, a policy response from the Fed or others. The Fed seems to be on top of this issue already. They've uh, provided uh, plenty of liquidity and they're certainly aware of these possibilities. We haven't gotten anywhere near those types of systemic failures. But in the event of a, an extraordinary systemic failure, then you would want to stop the markets. But I don't see that as uh, likely. It's certainly possible, but the probability is so small that I, I wouldn't be losing any sleep on it at all. Okay. Chester, you wanted to weigh in on this? 
Yeah, just just very brief, just very briefly. So so following following up on Larry's on Larry's uh, insights. Um, so one 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 relatively recent example we had where there w was a market closure for a number of days was right after was right after nine eleven, but that I think a, a lot of that had to do again with safety and feasibility issues associated with trading. Of course, the New York Stock Exchange then was in, was right near ground zero uh, and um, um, and, a, and a completely manual market at the time and of, and a, a lot of the, uh, the the transportation infrastructure and other infrastructure around New York City was was challenged and under and under stress so that would be a that would be an, an example of a, of a of a safe of a safety issue but I, I think the move to floor, to uh, electronic systems and greater resiliency sort of change, changes uh, uh, a lot of those considerations, of course. Right, it's interesting, interesting to note, of course, that during that episode, the bond markets, which were largely then telephonic markets, uh, continued to operate fine. That's a good point, right? And, and there was a lot of uh, concern about the New York Stock Exchange moving towards fully electronic trading for the first time in its history. Um, on Monday, and from all accounts, it seems that that uh, trading has gone off uh, without a hitch. So everything looks looks good there. Um, let me turn to a question that's come in through the uh, through the Zoom chat. Somebody asks, uh, "Why not ban short selling at this time, like we did in 2008 and 2009?" Um, Jim, let me start with you. Um, you were the chief economist at the commission. Um, that when it, they instituted this short selling ban and former chairman Chris Cox said that the, the biggest mistake of his tenure uh, was agreeing to the, the short selling ban during the financial crisis. And he said that he did so reluctantly because he was under intense pressure from other senior government officials. Now, I happened to be working at the White House at the time, and I can attest to the fact that there was an incredible amount of political pressure put on him to institute the short selling ban, despite the concerns that you and other economists had uh, at the time. Can you talk to us about, there's, there's been a lot talked about in terms of that short selling ban. Can you talk to us about um, the study that you helped oversee as well as some of the other empirical uh, evidence that we saw from, from, from the ban? And then I'll get the rest of the panelists to weigh in on, on short sale bans. Sure, and you're right. And being on the receiving end of that pressure, we certainly felt it at the time. Um, there was, a, tremendous pressure from the highest levels in the executive branch to, uh, to take that action. And it's an action that was really contrary to the SEC's view then, and I believe the view now that about short selling, that it's important because it helps investors uh, with price discovery, risk management, that it lowers the overall cost of trading and is helpful in raising capital. So banning short selling is something that is uh, a substantial, significant departure from uh, the SEC's long-held view on short selling. Um, and with respect to the experience in 2008, um, my office looked very closely at the impact uh, on the ban. Um, and what we found was that in net, it was harmful. And that's one reason the SEC took the action that it did to, uh, to remove the ban and as quickly as they did. The, the ban did curtail short sales in financial stocks, and there was a temporary order flow bump up in the share prices of those affected stocks as people exited their positions uh, to cover uh, or, or tried to cover their positions. Uh, but overall, there were many unintended consequences. And, and you mentioned uh, the, the study that we did in, in microstructure economists in my office looked trade by trade and parsed out short sales from long sales uh, during this uh, whole episode. And, uh, and they found uh, some interesting things. They found that, uh, first of all, that short selling was not as intense in falling markets as it was in uh, rising markets and that, uh, or, and that short sales were less aggressive than long sales. But then they also found a number of things. Let me just rattle off a few of them here. One is that the, stocks that were subject to the ban, uh, and not only those stocks, but related instruments like options and ETFs, uh, suffered a severe degrade, deg degradation in market quality measured by spreads, uh, price impact, intraday volatility. Another thing was that traders had to learn about 
what we call list risk. They didn't know which stocks were going to be added to the list on which day. And so they had to adjust their hedging strategies to account for what might happen in the future. And as hedging effectiveness was degraded because of these rule changes, we saw deleveraging because their hedges were less effective and this affected uh, a number of market players. But uh, certainly we saw market makers respond uh, by managing their risk in alternative ways, such as raising or widening their spreads. And we also saw migration from the, fa the affected stocks to uh, off exchange instruments like uh, uh, equity swaps or credit derivatives. And, and these were not nearly as transparent as the uh, price, as the stocks on the uh, public exchange traded markets. And just two more things we found that uh, arbitrage between related markets was impaired, which damaged uh, price discovery. And finally, that the ban absolutely crushed the convertible bond market, which harmed those firms that were looking for alternative sources of financing using this uh, avenue. So those were some of the things we found. Uh, the study that you mentioned is public and can be found uh, on the SEC website. It, it was also delivered to Congress, so it can be found there as well. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in on the prospects of uh, of short sale bans here? Wave your hand, and I'll and I'll call in Chester. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it, 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 you know, it seems it, it seems it seems to me that um, that Jim po pointed to some of the really the key issues, um, and that one of the problems with in the ban was that there was tremendous regulatory uncertainty. This list uncertainty, for example, uh, regulators need to be need to be careful. Um, you know, as, as, as we move forward, not to instill needless uncertainty. The fundamental way that I look at short selling, I, I should say, and particularly with respect to financial crisis, is to try to reflect on why asset prices are going down when they're going down in these crises, such as, let's take the case of 2008, which is a very concrete example. Why did prices go down in 2008? I think it's very simple. People didn't want to pay as much as they had previously paid to buy the asset. That's the fundamental. It has nothing to do with short sales. Short sales were kind of an excuse. Frankly, I think it was an excuse that was foisted in part by a few CEOs from Wall Street who wanted to create cover, or partially with the administration, um, as to why their stock values were going down. And their stock values were going down because they had done a horrible job in risk management and because the value of the assets that they were holding was dramatically lower. Um, this is the fundamental. Um, asset prices go down because people don't want to pay as much. Um, that's the relevant margin. The buy, the buy side is at the, is at the margin. And one of the horrors that we had in two, one of the ways in which I think the SEC tried to deal with the issues as responsibly as it could, by the way, under tremendous pressure, as a number of folks have alluded to, one of the challenges was the option market makers said, look, if this is the world we're going to live in, if we're going to be subject to this, we're not going to make the options markets. Now the staff, to its credit, then back then encouraged the commission to exempt those market makers. That was, I think, the right thing to do for that issue. But it's a, in a broad scheme of things, it's a horrible thing to do. Why do we want to provide a special exemption to those market makers so that they can earn wide spreads at the expense of the public? Um, this is this is not what our regulators should be doing. And and I feel all of these lessons are very relevant to the current context. But fortunately, I think we're not hearing yet lots of talk about, about short selling, as far as I can tell, about short selling bans, as far as I can tell. Good. Larry, you wanted to weigh in here? Sure. A uh, couple comments. First, in um, reflecting on uh, Chester's comments about 2008. Uh, prices dropped in 2008 initially for two reasons. Um, valuations clearly had dropped, and as a consequence, prices should drop. But also a lot of uh, people who are highly levered got into trouble. And uh, their uh, attempts to unwind their long positions and to uh, raise cash to uh, remain solvent uh, caused them to sell uh, securities that in many cases had no um, fundamental issues at all. Um, if you wanted to make an argument for short selling, it would be that you want to pre prevent people who anticipate those problems uh, from short selling and pushing prices down to cause a crisis that would uh, reward their positions. Um, but the trouble with that is that uh, if you followed that argument, you would impose the short selling restriction before the crisis started. But how the hell would you know when that was going to happen? 
uh, and there are so many other reasons not to impose short selling restrictions, uh, you wouldn't want to do that just on a blanket uh, a priori basis. Uh, to this, I'm going to add two other very quick points. First of all, as uh, noted, but uh, should be reinforced, much uh, provision of liquidity by dealers uh, and other traders like day traders, and much arbitrage by uh, all sorts of different types of traders, including uh, people like index enhancers, is done for, uh, using short positions. Uh, so if we prohibit short uh, trading, uh, then we'd have to either give them exemptions or figure out how they can get enough capital so they can continue to do their business from long positions. Uh, that would be very challenging. And the regulatory problems associated with that, uh, you know, how to distinguish between a bona fide supplier of liquidity and somebody who is a day trader or trading over a week's period or something like that would be incredibly difficult. So uh, that's a place you wouldn't want to go. The second issue that um, I wanted to address very quickly is the following observation. It's pretty clear whether it's stated or not that the reason we want uh, short sale bans, or at least most people want them, uh, those who do, is because they want to support the market. Well, supporting the market means trying to get prices to be higher. The problem with that is when prices are above their fundamentals, uninformed traders can often buy, often will buy, not knowing that prices are above fundamentals. When things return to normal, uh, prices drop and those traders lose. I don't think we should be creating an environment where uninformed traders are uh, basically sucked into situations where they buy at uh, overvalued prices only to suffer losses later. That's just not, not a sensible thing for a modern economy. Yeah, Jim, you, have, you had an interesting story you wanted to point out on that where um, in the absence of short selling, a, a, stock, a, a price of a particular stock went way up and some uninformed traders were buying at very high prices. you mind sharing that for just one minute? Well, sure. We're watching uh, all of this on Zoom today. And Zoom stock, uh, the technology that's making our conference happen, their ticker symbol is ZM, but there's another company also called Zoom with ticker symbol Z-O-O-M. And their stock price uh, soared as uh, during the, the recent crisis, presumably from uninformed traders who were buying their stock as opposed to Zoom, the video conferencing stock. Now, it turns out the the Zoom, the incorrect Zoom, uh, is a stock that's very hard to borrow and therefore very hard to short. So you would think that, that would, otherwise that would be an ideal opportunity for a short seller to come in and uh, help bring the price back into its uh, proper alignment. But um, and so it, it, that did not happen immediately. I, I haven't looked at the price in a couple of days, but uh, apparently it's a very hard stock to, to short. Uh, there's, another, there's another story that's worth repeating very quickly. Alpha Protech is a, co a small company that produces uh, face masks for medical um, purposes and, and gowns and so forth. <laughs> if you look at their price history, they have a spike on every uh, pandemic or a rumor of a pandemic. The spike on this one was enormous. They went from a price of between $5 and $10 to above $40. And it was the short sellers that pushed them back down to where they uh, probably, of course, I'm no authority on valuation, but probably closer to where they, be, where they should be. There's no question that the prospects of this company have improved tremendously with the COVID crisis, but it doesn't look like it's a $40 company to an awful lot of people. Uh, interestingly, um, so the short sellers became very active. This despite the fact that the cost of borrowing the stock approached um, and went above 60% per year. And now the stock is down again around uh, between 10 and 15. Uh, so all those folks who in their enthusiasm went out and bought the stock at uh, 30 or 40, uh, they made a mistake. But how much more would they have lost if, if the short sellers hadn't been allowed to, to uh, step in and perhaps the stock would have gone to 80 or something? That just wrong price signals. Yeah. Okay. Let's, um, another question that's come in um, from folks in the audience is um, thoughts about moving to a three to four hour equity trading day or only trading uh, three days per week. So last week, we know that Secretary Mnuchin said, on the one hand, he said, we absolutely believe in keeping markets open. But then he seemed to surprise a number of market participants when he brought up the possibility of shorter trading hours. So rather than thinking about this in terms of a binary sort of decision between either closing markets or keeping them open, um, some folks have been suggesting why not maybe shorten the, the, the trading hours, right? So, so 
um, what would, would there be any benefits of doing so? And what would be the cost of doing so? Uh, I'll throw that open to the group and raise your hand and see who wants to, to talk about uh, that first. Craig, do you want to go? Sure. <clears throat> um, it just seems to me that if we are arguing that markets should remain open, that shortening the window in which they remain open serves no real true purpose. Markets are, you know, it, it, as Larry pointed out earlier, they don't happen in a pit anymore, right? They don't happen on a floor. It's not individual person to person exchanges and markets are electronic. As long as the electronic markets continue to function the way they are now, there's really no compelling reason to shut them down. And trading takes place globally. It's not just in the US where trading occurs. So honest, I don't quite understand what the purpose of closing the market was. Um, as an aside, I polled my colleagues to ask whether they thought markets should be closed. And one response was, why is that even a question? <laughs> oh, very good. Jeff, do you want to weigh in on this? I think, I mean, reiterating the whole fact that markets are valuable, I think that some of the stories we've heard of market signals, whether it be individual stocks or the, you know, the broad cross section of different segments of the economy, uh, it's important to get market signals back. I think lost and maybe in the big picture of this is that the markets actually did function very well. We said huge records and billions of trading in shares last week. Um, I don't think that would have happened if there were, share, you know, trades that didn't go off if we would have shortened the trading day and trades wouldn't have been able to be accomplished, that probably would have been a big sign that we're then inhibiting people who intended to trade and not allowing that. And I don't think that's a very good constraint we want to put on the market. I, I do think in the broader picture, one of the things we're maybe looking past here is that the Fed, when we hit the crisis in 2008, were, was throwing money at the market as well and trying to boost liquidity. I think the academic studies since then have shown that the, the, the problems in 2008 were liquidity problems. And that's really created some, exacerbated the problems we saw over those, those years. It was more of a counterparty risk problem where financial institutions had um, these assets on their balance sheet that we didn't know about. In this market, I think we're pretty clear that the COVID problem has become a liquidity problem. We know that businesses are gonna need capital. We know that the employees and the citizens of the United States are gonna, you know, that we see unemployment spike this morning. Um, we have a lot of evidence that it is a liquidity problem and we're going to need capital. And so whatever we can do, I think, to facilitate that capital formation, whether it's in keeping the markets open and avoiding trading halts and any other number of things would be valuable, I think. Okay. Chester. Well, I, I would just add to that. It's possible that there could be some solvency issues. I, I see the solvency issue as really more about the going forward um, uh, value, value of, of businesses. And if, you know, this is really an issue of how, how, how radically uh, will, will our economy need to change uh, going, going, going forward over, 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 over time. So it's possible there could be some solvency issues, but I also agree that the issues right now look primarily to be liquidity-like. Okay. okay, Larry. A um, couple quick observations about our present markets. Uh, we have an awful lot of trading that's now taking place before the open and trading that takes place after the close. So if you shorten trading hours and you didn't deal with that issue, you wouldn't change things very much. Uh, people are going to trade when they want to trade. But that said, I'll note that most price discovery does take place at the opening auction and at the closing auction. Uh, so if there were truly interest in shortening trading, maybe what they ought to do is uh, close for lunch like they do in Jap Japan. Um, or at least, I don't know if they still do, but I know they used to do that. Um, and in that way, maybe we might have somewhat more civilized markets. The problem with that, of course, is with three, with three time zones, closing at lunch uh, disadvantages a lot of people. In a country with three time zones in a world where uh, trading is spread in, uh, all across the world, it seems uh, a little bit unwise to be uh, shortening the trading hours. The only argument for doing it would be, again, to protect workers. Uh, in the industry. But as uh, all the trading is now distributed all over uh, people's offices, nobody has to physically convene very much. Uh, I don't see this as a particular issue. Okay. Uh, another question that's come through is um, relating to circuit breakers. And we've talked a little bit uh, in passing about them. So in the equity markets, we have sort of three tiers of circuit breakers based upon downward movements in the S&P 500 index. 
Um, you know, they've stopped trading uh, once it goes below 7%, and then there's one at 13% and 20%. And last week, at the 7% tier one um, circuit breakers tripped, I believe, four times, um, but we never made it down to that next level down. And the question is relate, well, so the general question uh, that I have is, are they working as intended? Do you think they worked well, given what we went through last week? They had not been tripped, I think, since, since 1997 was maybe the last time that they had been they've been tripped. Um, and, and then the question was in particular about the discrepancy between the, the, the synchronization of the futures market and the equities markets where the futures market has a minus 5% one um, for that. And it was there, did, do you see any, did, do we, did, do we see any actual problems and do, or do we see any potential problems from that? Chester? I, I, well, I think, I think right now we have an awkward regulatory design where we have we have the, fu the futures tripping at 5% and the economy-wide circuit breakers at, 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 at 7%. Now, do I think that there, there's been severe problems from this so far? No. And some of it is that the circuit breakers are basically tripping overnight. Um, the 7% have been tripping overnight at the open. And I, I almost view this as sort of largely largely irrelevant. It's almost like the market is starting at 9, 9.45 a.m. But, but, but the purpose of the circuit breaker in part was to help everybody become informed as to what was going on. But the fact is, as Larry was referring to, that we have so much overnight trading and that, the, and that and it was clear where the valuations were going to be, it's not clear that the circuit breaker was really accomplishing much by having it kicking off in the open in that way. And I, 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 could Im I do imagine that there could be scenarios if these, if these different restrictions were more were tighter, then I could imagine that having the one at 5% and the other at 7% um, would be somewhat problematic because if the 5% triggers, then potentially if, if the price discovery were really interfered with, with respect to the futures, that could lead to bigger, could lead to bigger, could lead to a bigger decline. And so it, it does seem to me that's greater, that the regulators ought to step back and create more harmony in how they think about the overall system with respect to these types of stoppages. Okay. Jim, did you want to weigh in on this? Um, I think it's everything that's been said is, is right. I think there's coordination issues. I, I just add one other thing, and that is one of the things that uh, we have looked at, or we, meaning financial economists in general, have looked at in with respect to uh, to circuit breakers has been the possibility of a magnet effect or gravitational effect and how that might actually have an effect on the, the volatility of the stocks that you're seeing. But uh, I don't think, as Chester mentioned, with these things happening primarily at the open, I'm not sure that that's uh, really an issue, has been an issue this last week. Okay, Larry? A um, couple of additional points that not yet been made. Uh, first of all, um, one of the reasons for halting markets uh, is to ensure that you can collect from people who are having margin problems, uh, additional margin to keep them in the game. Uh, this is the reason why we have uh, daily price moves in the futures markets. Uh, we want to stop the markets before they've moved as far as they may move, because uh, if you allow them to move completely very quickly, people may not pay their uh, margin bills. But if uh, they don't know how far it's going to move to stay in the game, they may pay the bills. And so that's an important uh, systemic uh, protection that, uh, that these uh, broad circuit breakers uh, potentially can provide. Another thing that we should mention is that circuit breakers are very important to people who supply liquidity, especially with standing orders. And uh, for this purpose, now we're talking about uh, uh, tighter circuit breakers like the limit up and limit down stories. Um, so what a circuit breaker does is it says when the market's moving very quickly, uh, we will uh, stop the markets and give you a chance to cancel your order and we'll resume the market with a single price auction. So what it effectively does is it ensures that people who are offering liquidity are given protection against information that uh, flows so quickly that they can't respond. Uh, if they're not equipped to uh, cancel their orders very quickly, uh, then this is an advantage to them. Uh, and it helps protect them. And by protecting them, we ensure that they continue to supply liquidity. High frequency traders pretty much have this facility already, but many people supply liquidity as day traders who don't have the ability to cancel their orders instantly because their computers are watching uh, data feeds and, and information feeds. And so there's a potential advantage here. And of course, um, 
there is uh, some notion that by simply having circuit breakers, we slow things down and that uh, somehow gives people uh, more confidence um, uh, and a chance to sort of uh, stop and say, is this really what's, what sh we should be doing? Should I respond? The evidence here is mixed. As Jim said, uh, circuit breakers may have a magnetic effect as you're approaching them. Uh, it increases volatility because people are afraid that they won't be able to do their sales. On the other hand, um, after the circuit breakers trip, maybe, uh, and we've seen this happen a couple of times, prices bounce back as people realize, gee, uh, things are not really as bad as they are, uh, giving, them, giving us some time to slow things down. Um, big problems happen when things are closely linked. Uh, so when uh, you have a lot of computerized trading and people responding in mechanical ways, uh, sometimes you just want to stop things because if things happen that the computers weren't programmed to anticipate because the programmers didn't anticipate it, uh, you need a chance for somebody to make a manual decision. A regime in which you have circuit breakers that are um, coordinated, uh, that are well understood and not arbitrary and that don't hang on, on too long simply stops trading for a while and then trading resumes. I don't think that it has uh, detrimental effects on the market too much. Um, I'd like to see the markets continue trading, but if we impose circuit breakers for these reasons, it, it's not such a bad thing. Okay, thanks, Larry. So a couple, couple related questions that have come in related to either automated trading or electronic trading, and Larry and, and, and other folks have alluded to the fact that you know, basically all of our markets either are doing fully electronic trading or have moved to do so um, more recently. Jeff, let me start with you. The futures markets went to fully electronic trading um, several years ago. Um, there's a couple questions related to, you know, are they, are they aggregating and reflecting the information correctly? And then, the, and then the related question is, are they contributing somehow to excess volatility in the market? So, um, talk to us about electronic trading. Yeah, I think, well, we've learned a lot about uh, how electronification and how moving away from trading floors has affected markets over the years. And there's been a number of academic studies that look at these types of things. Um, you know, back when you had the crash in 87, I can remember that. And there was a few studies following that looked at, you know, we've had market crashes historically. We've had panics historically well before the advent of the computer. And so I think market technology, I think in this case has proven to be actually a big benefit for the markets. Um, if we were trading everyone on the trading floor and COVID's floating around the streets of New York City, um, th there would be no markets going on right now. So I think that this move to electronification has been, a, is, I think this is a huge highlight of the advantages of that structure. Now the question is, you know, becomes, is it excessive volatility or not? I mean, I think most people who have studied these markets have shown, yeah, that there's no really cause and effect. There's no evidence necessarily systematically that computerized trading have driven volatility to any levels beyond what they would be. One of the problems from an economist standpoint is you want good volatility that reflects the information flows that are coming in and you want to avoid the bad volatility that's induced by the trading system. And I think we've had at least decades now of work with electronic systems that show that electronic systems themselves, if they are inducing excessive volatility in the market, they're not going to be very successful because traders don't want to use those types of systems. And, you know, NASDAQ has adopted ECN technology. New York has bought the ARCA, ARCA technology. And so the technology that we use for trading on the exchanges is actually, I think, been fairly well vetted and approved and I think stood the test of time for not inducing volatility that's excessive. Okay, good. Anybody else want to weigh in on electronic trading and the effect on volatility. We have about one minute left before I'm going to turn it back over. Larry? Um, very quickly. Um, so uh, there are only two ways to attenuate volatility. Uh, fundamental volatility is attenuated primarily by ensuring that the government doesn't act in surprising ways that are capricious and stupid. Uh, and for that, we just have to hope that our uh, decision makers are wise. Um, the uh, transitory volatility is associated with the market making processes and, and uh, price formation and so forth, uh, that volatility is attenuated by uh, people who supply liquidity, the high frequency traders, the dealers, the uh, day traders, and anybody else who feels that by using a limit order instead of a market order, they might get a better price. Anything we do to protect those traders uh, um, serves uh, to reduce that kind of volatility and makes the market stronger and resilient. The worst thing we might do is to uh, impose a transaction tax, which uh, hurts those traders and of course all other traders. 
that would cause liquidity to dry up. And in circumstances like that, that would be extraordinarily foolish. There have been a few proposals to do it in uh, before the crisis came along. They've been renewed a little bit. We're not hearing a lot of voice for it, but it would be incredibly foolish to try to impose transaction costs at this point. I have to run because I have to teach. I want to thank Mike and Rena. I know you're going to close up shortly, but I have to, I have to bun off. Take yeah, care. Thank, thank you. you so much for this opportunity. Bye yeah, you. thank you, Larry. And I want, to th I want to thank all the panelists. We've covered a number of topics in a very, very short period of time. And I think we've opened up some more for continued discussion at some point in the future. This is it's been an absolute pleasure of mine to uh, to engage in this conversation with you all. I, I, I've always learned a lot from, from speaking to each of you individually, and today was no uh, exception to that. So with that, let me turn it over to Alberto for some closing words. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief, given that we are uh, out of time. I'd like to thank very much the moderator, Mike Pivovar, as well as our panelists, Jim Overdahl, Larry Harris, Jeffrey Harris, Chester Spad, and Craig Lewis. I would also like to thank a lot our audience. We received an incredible number of great questions. Unfortunately, we did not have the time to cover them all in given the limited amount of time we have available. Uh, note that we'll be issuing a press release in the afternoon based on today's discussion. And going forward, make sure to follow us on Twitter at GU Fin Policy. We're planning many initiatives for the coming weeks and the coming months, and we'd love you to see you there either physically or virtually. Thank you very much.